any man here. Can we not yet hope to see a clearer sky? Well, it might. Long residence in London, as uh, this colony's agent to the court has taught me anything, Mr. Dickinson, it has taught me this, that given the choice between doing what is right and doing what is not right, His Majesty's government will take the latter course every time. Uh, here, 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 here. The King refuses our petitions. He has branded us rebels. The question is not whether, by a, by a declaration of independence, that we should make ourselves something we are not, but whether we should declare a fact something which already exists. Yeah. 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 Only the voice of the people can proclaim independence. No, no, no Mr. Dickinson. The people wait for us to lead the way. Yeah. And we must lose no time in leading them, sir. No time at all. And just whom do you think will join us in this folly? Yeah. France. 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 England is our common enemies. Mr. Adams would make us French subjects. Partners, Mr. Twain, not subjects. King Louis cannot be expected to acknowledge us until we have acknowledged ourselves and taken our rightful place as a sovereign power. Mr. Adams? Mr. Franklin has a floor. Mr. Adams is right. No alliance comes. But then, sir. Then so be it. Profile of a founder. Let's talk about these guys, where we're at at this day and time, what they were doing back then, what they looked like. And I want to also, we'll go into who they were and how they changed international law. Let's talk about the Declaration of Independence real quick, because everybody thinks this is such a magnanimous document. I didn't think it was a magnanimous document. I've written better documents than this. Not in the beginning, but I'm getting better. Okay. And plus, I have their experience to go back and look at it. So oh, let's tweak this up. Let's do better. Let's do, a matter of fact, and let's not deceive everybody by using capital P's and lowercase P's and those kind of things. And by putting commas in there where people can't tell the difference between the people of the United States and the United States of America. I won't go into it anymore. But the declaration, even in Wikipedia, says it is the usual name of a statement adopted by the Continental Congress. So it's nothing more than a statement. That's what a declaration is. It's a statement. They were stating something that they were going to do as a reason for them creating a new state. Let's talk about the history. I put the false history up here again because most people don't know it. And the reason they don't know it was because they weren't told. Now, people say, well, they, for once it told, that doesn't mean I was told a lie. I'm like, well, it doesn't mean you were told the truth either. So let's cover a bit of it. Twelve of the 13 states chose a total of 74 delegates to attend what was known as the Federal Convention. Now, this is on the Constitution, by the way. This is the, not the Declaration. This is the Constitution. Nineteen of delegates uh, chose not to accept election or attend the debates, for example. Patrick Henry of Virginia was one of those. He thought the state politics were far more interesting because he, he wanted the state to be his country, not the United States. And uh, so when he saw the Constitutional Convention going on, he's, it's in his writings. You can read the Federalist Papers. He said, I smell a rat. Of course, he also said a lot of other stuff, like once you guys sign this Constitution, your president's going to have the powers of a king. Rhode Island did not send delegates at all. If anybody knows the real history of this, once George Washington was elected president, he sent troops in there to make Rhode Island sign it. Now, there's a reason for that, too. It's discussed in the DVD sets. And by the way, they were not called states by the King of France. They were called provinces. They were called the provinces of British North America. That's in the Treaty of Versailles, 1782. The point is, is that it says that all the governors countersigned all the power that the Congress requested. Why? Because they didn't have a choice. They were in violation of the law of nations, and they were in violation of three treaties, as James Madison said, and they were about to go back to war if they didn't guarantee those debts be paid. Now, we'll go through a little bit more history, but of the 55 who did attend, no more than 38 delegates showed up at one time, and as we know, 39 men ended up signing this. They were the people. They became the people. They did it for themselves and their posterity. Most of them were well-educated men of means who were leaders in their community. They were prominent in national affairs. 
their political experience is shown here that some of them had held political office in the colonial state governments. They had also a majority had held county and local governance. Two of them had served as presidents of the Continental Congress. Eight of them signed a Declaration of Independence. This means eight that signed the Constitution had already signed the Declaration. So not all the same people were signing all the same documents all the time. Six of those guys that signed the Constitution, signed the Articles of Confederation. Two signed all three documents, which would have been the Articles of Confederation, Declaration of Independence, and the Constitution. Four of those men had been governors of one of the states or colonies. They had a wide range of high and middle class status occupations, and they pursued more than one career simultaneously. Many of them did, which means they weren't locked into one thing. You know, there were much more of, um, what do you call it, Renaissance men back then. They were businessmen. They were lawyers. They knew the law. They knew how to farm. They also knew the sciences. They knew medicine. They had big libraries. They were constant students. They didn't have television to distract them and all this other football and things that we have now. 35 had legal training, though not all of them practiced law. Some had also been local judges. 14 owner managed slave operated plantations or farms. 13 were merchants. 11 speculated in securities on a large scale. Seven were major land speculators. Many of the northern, uh, wealthy northerners owned domestic slaves. Eight of the men received a substantial part of their income from holding public office. Eight, three of them re- had retired from economic endeavors, which were Franklin McHenry and Mifflin. Franklin and Williamson were scientists. Some others were physicians, and Johnson was a college president. Here again, we're just talking about the profile of what these men were back then. And I do have a point with this we'll get to in just a second. Most of the 1787 delegates were natives of the colonies. Nine were born elsewhere, four in Ireland, two in England, two in Scotland, one in the West Indies, which was Alexander Hamilton. Seventeen individuals had already lived, studied, or worked in more than one state or colony. Several others had studied or traveled abroad. The founding fathers had strong educational backgrounds at some of the colonial colleges or abroad. Some were largely self-taught and learned through apprenticeship. As a matter of fact, if you read the biography of John Adams, you had to apprentice to be and be accepted on the bar by your equals to become a peer, so to speak, inside the court. It wasn't easy like it is now, just going to college and passing a test. That was not done back then. But they were also more widely read, especially in the Law of Nations. Adams himself was told by his mentor that there's no such thing as a good attorney without a copy of the Law of Nations sitting on their desk and also a copy of the Code of Ethics. Others had obtained instruction for private tutors or academies. Half had attended or graduated college. Some had medical degrees or advanced tech training in theology. Most of the education was in the colonies, but several were lawyers that trained in the inns of court in London. The bottom line is they had a large pool of highly trained legal and business experts, entrepreneurs, from which they could pull. They were people trained in every skill and profession, not specialized the way people are now, like a doctor would specialize just in heart surgery, or, or an attorney may just specialize in, say, workers' comp claims and things like that. And I said they had large libraries. The point is, is that I didn't start learning this till I was age 40. I would be back then among those times. That was their average age. And these guys were already running governments. They already had the ability to do this. They were so far ahead of the curve from myself and, and everyone else in the world today, in my opinion, except for those that are already doing it, those that have already been trained, those posterity of those people from the very beginning, because they ensure that they train their posterity. If you'll recall, I did a presentation on something called the occult technology of power, how one gentleman was weaning his son to take over his entire dynasty. And he said that after he went through all the hoops that he put him through and he passed all the tests, that he was the one that got selected. And he said, you and I will now work together for 20 years until we become one. This is the mindset of people that build things. This is the mindset of people that build a new society. And unfortunately, it's the mindset that we're going to have to take if we're going to help ourselves and our posterity for the future. How they changed international law. Let's talk about this for a minute because they did do something different with their declaration. The conception of the American state is based on the Declaration of Independence of the United States. Now, by the way, this document here, where this writing is coming from, was in 1916 written in the American Institute of International Law, which is part of the Organization of American States. But this institute was started way back in 1912. The first speech was given by... James Scott Brown in 1916 on the rights and duties of nations. So he's getting into this thing about page 22 of 23 about how the American states actually all formed. 
And he does say in here that we do not need to trouble ourselves about the original state or indeed how the states of Europe came into existence. We take our stand on a new continent, a new world. So we did things differently. From an intellectual and political standpoint, we know how each of the American states came into being. We know that high-minded men assembled each one of the 21 republics in our Western continent in order to create a political society for themselves, separate and distinct from that of the Western countries, whereof they were colonists. It is not necessary to recount the process by which this happened, as with a single instance, that of the United States, which happens to be the oldest and which has served as a model to all. They had no doubt as their right to do this. They had no doubt as their position which their state would take when they assumed among the powers of the earth a separate and equal station. So they also had no doubt as to the nature of the state or the political society, which they were creating, as it is stated, in their reasons in their declaration. The members of the Congress apparently regarded it as a natural course of things for one section or group of people to separate itself from another. Well, they were getting that out of the Law of Nations, Section 33 in Book 1, and also in 2.12, where it says, if you don't find it advantageous, quit, leave. And that's why he says there's nothing mystic or hidden or divine about any of this, because the separation which the founders of these republics had in mind was to happen in the course of human events, not divine events. Every republic of the Western continent has followed this example, the right of emancipation, which is now the right of self-determination. This right exists. If it did not exist, we would have no right to be here. Now, he's talking about all those 21 republics because that was who was represented at this opening speech at the American Institute. If this right does not exist, then we have no right to be here. And if this theory of the original state was not in accord with the old theories or books of authority, then we should change the theory and discard that authority rather than renounce our statehood. What he's talking about here is their right to develop republics and have common elections and those kind of things that they have versus what had happened in Europe with kings over time and how states were formed there. It was different. But let's talk about now what they didn't tell you and what they do not understand, even as James Brown Scott. The USA never got out from under Britain or the Pope. Therefore, the U.S., since it was the model, none of the American states came out from under Britain or the Pope. This is covered in the DVD series. If you don't understand this, then you need to find out why they didn't come out, because they never did. The U.S. is still under the Pope and still under the, under Britain, and Britain is under the Vatican, too. Now, I'm not saying they're not in partnership together with each other anymore, but they do have a hierarchy to their structure. And it's all been done by treaty. It's all been done by global agreements. They have also contracted with central banks to enslave their people. The borrower is a slave to the lender. And debtors have no rights in international law other than what the creditors are willing to extend. And we see these reorganizations all the time because they can't pay their debts. Why can't they pay their debts? They're using debt-based money. You can't pay your debt with debt-based money. Every time you print debt-based money, you create more debt. So you can't extinguish a debt from a debt that's ever expanding. It's another reason for leaving the state, for quitting it. It's not advantageous to be a part of that. Now, you can still use it once you have immunity and you have exemptions. You operate by variation by agreement because you still have to be in the world. You might not be of their world, like he said up here in this document. This was a new world, the 21 republics of the Western continent. They take their stand on a new continent, a new world, which, by the way, they refer to in Star Trek and some of the other television programs when they talk about worlds. They're not talking about planets. They're talking about this planet. They're talking about what has been created here. The point is, is that when it comes to the United States of America, if this is going to be their model, this all started right after the United States signed the Constitution. They formed the first bank of the United States, which was a central bank. Every American state has had a president. Your president will have the powers of a king. John Quincy Adams said in the Jubilee of the Constitution that the president had more than dictatorial powers. And since he was the sixth president, I'm assuming that he knew what he was talking about. And that in the dialogue on the Exchequer, which we cover in the DVD series, that the president does all things for the king. This was out of the a document that was written, they say, on the Avalon Project going back or earlier than 1100. 